I'm Mark Weber of the Computer History Museum. I'm here with my colleague Chris Garcia, and we're interviewing Cindy Mason, who started the first computer science department in the outback of Australia. And thank you for talking with us. Thank you. Nice to be here. So just start really briefly with um, your background, where did you grow up, your full name, um, and what well, say that first. Shoe size, a little hat bit size, of, ring size, etc. Yeah, okay. credit card number. Uh, I grew up from I in Indiana. Um, my dad was a math teacher, and my mom worked at the bank, but she later became a homicide detective. So there's a little bit of um, my. Well, when I grew up, my dad was always talking about math all over the house, car trips, long car trips. Was that fun or not? You know, mostly I just absorbed it. Um, at times we would definitely avoid uh, being in a room with Dad alone because he would talk a lot. But, um, you know, it really did help me not even think about being afraid of math because he just made it fun, I guess. And so you got interested in computing as a child or later? Yeah, I think some of my childhood experiences definitely made it an unthinking move uh, right. to, to work on computers in college and then later. I, my, our ba my babysitter had a robot arm he was working on in the basement and uh, I, I just thought it was neat. And then we had some other relative in Pensacola, Florida that worked for the Navy and I remember once being in this giant dark cold room with all these machines and the lights and stuff. And, and I also thought that was neat. So I just think, uh, you know, they said, what do you want to major in in college? And I always had an easy time with math in school. Um, so in fact, in school, I took, um, I took math in the advanced classes because I guess I could figure the solutions out differently or somehow and then um, do you want me to talk about that high school math <laughs> I mean if very well, I, quickly I took high I took high school classes in grade school so uh, my dad would just drag me along and I so I learned how to type in fourth grade so I think that might be one thing that makes it easy for me on computers too because I was like it was easy and I set records for typing and and then I was kind of interested in codes and hieroglyphics and and I Greg shorthand was also I set records for that it was just fun for me so and you like puzzles I, I didn't like puzzles so much I liked stories I suppose and what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up Oh boy, well, um, you know, mostly people didn't ask me that. Uh, the truth is because I was from Indiana, I was taught things like how to make a good pie crust and peach pie and uh, making a hope chest for future husband and family. That's but how I was raised. But if your mother was a homicide detective, that's That was like later. Okay. And she was married to my dad, she didn't work, and she wasn't allowed to work. She wasn't allowed to drive. That's what they fought about all the time. <laughs> Actually, do we want to put this on the film? <laughs> oh, anyway, but it's a real, it's really part of, I think, what some women have gone through um, in the past. And uh, so, yeah, she was, my mom was very independent. That was the time that women were starting to burn their bras in the 60s and, um, wanting to work, wanting to have independent money, wanting to be able to have their own cars. And back in Indiana, the, you know, there was a struggle inside the house about that, so. And so. But there was no question we'd go to college. Was that a struggle? That's right. No, Dad said, um, well, there had been three generations of people that went to Purdue. And he said, when we were little, uh, he used to dress us up like these little bumblebees. They were the colors of Purdue were, were black and yellow, and we go to the football games dressed like that. I mean, it's, it's a little, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the truth. 
<laughs> so it was okay. You went to Purdue then? I yes. Think. Yes. And majored in computer science? I majored in computer science, although I started out in oceanography because um, I loved the ocean. We used to go adventuring uh, on vacations and often went to Florida. And uh, so I started out in oceanography, but the truth is I ended up in the computer science building all the time. And I made these friends there and we'd stay up all night long uh, drinking coffee and programming. And uh, friends and family thought I was out partying, but really I was in the basement of the computer <laughs> science building. So. And so what, how old were you when you first used a computer then? Um, probably 16. Yeah. Well, if the robot arm counts, I was probably nine. So you were programming, the, helping with the... Well, it, it was my babysitter, and he sort of just tolerated me being there, but when he was gone, I would go in back in the room and look at what was going on. It was mostly mechanical engineering, I think, the... But it was in your basement or his basement? No, it was, in, it was in his family's basement. So we would go over there, and the kids would be there, because... Mm, got it. Mm -hmm. It was easier, I guess, for... The parents were going out to do things, and so... So you would play with the robot arm. Sorry? So you would play with the robot arm and do... Th uh, well, mostly I studied the way that it would move, and he was trying to teach it handwriting. Oh. And uh, so, but we also listened a lot to Jimi Hendrix, and I think that actually had a big influence, too. On computing in your life? On, on being, um, th thinking differently. I guess not being afraid of that, thinking it was normal. I, I don't know how to explain that looking back. But I still like Jimi Hendrix. Me too. So then after college, what did you do? So after I graduated, I got uh, my bachelor's degree. I, I got a job at Lawrence Livermore Lab, which is out here in California. And uh, the, my college sweetheart and I moved out here with actually a group of friends. We said, hey, there's a moving van showing up, you guys. If you want to go to California, get your stuff over here. Because we had, I think it was 1,500 pounds. And you know, at that point in your life, you don't own a lot of things. So anybody who wanted to go put their stuff in the van, and we all came out. And um, so I worked at Lawrence Livermore Lab in their uh, giant computing center there, which had, uh, I was a programmer on the disk farms, which is basically what you now call a cloud. And uh, the, the transition to Australia happened when uh, my husband, who actually my college sweetheart and I got married, but we um, followed his job. So his job went into Australia. And that was after being at Livermore for about one year. I was also a grad student at the time, too. I enrolled in grad school while I was Where? at Livermore Lab. Um, it was an interdisciplinary program with University of California through Berkeley, um, UC Davis, and then the lab. There were, uh, it was Edward Teller had like a, a special program for distributed computing and physics. And so um, just outside the gates of the lab, they had all these uh, physics and computer people come out and teach classes. So. Um, did you actually work with Teller? I never worked with him, but he was our department chair. So when a secretary had a birthday, he would show up and make a speech. Or if you know something important happened around there, he would show up. But. Yeah. And what what time frame was this? This was. 70? That was in the eighties. Eighties. Okay. So this was. Were you working with the Octopus Network for the disk, the disk system? Um, well, I was over in the computer center that had to do with running uh, magnetic fusion energy experiments. Oh, the tokamak. No, the. Yeah, there was a tokamak. They brought in those big magnets one weekend, using but the I old mean, Egyptian method of the telephone poles and the crane, mm -hmm. oh, dragging wow. the magnet across. So. But uh, what's the thing they have now? That's an it. Uh, they've got all kinds of stuff because they've transitioned out of weapons. Because I was just on a tour there where they showed us the fusion thing, but that's mm. that was much 
Yeah, the ignition facility. That's more recent. Yeah, it's more. Yeah. yeah. So that was. So you were in the uh, the disk side. Well, there was a whole separate area of computing in, at the lab that had to do with physics, and running the programs that the lab had. And those guys were creating distributed operating systems for the first time, and the protocols for distributed, op you know, the stack. Um, and these, those guys were some of our teachers. But where I actually worked was uh, a place that provided national support to anybody who was running experiments with right. magnetic fusion. So we were sort of right. like uh, remote computing and, and cloud support for their files. And my job was to make sure that the disks didn't have collisions. So I, I, I wrote an integrity checker for those massive, and it was a really, actually very cool disk farm because we had robots going out to fetch little, you know, so there was a hierarchy of faster and slower retrieval all the way back to tapes, if you can believe it. But sometimes that's well, what they was. they still use tapes. Yeah, when you run 10 years worth of research, you, you end up storing things on slower media. But this was in, because I saw their, their main facility with the disks now. It's the, probably the same building because they had a timeline of stuff going way back. Though. Did you see the movie Tron? Oh, yeah. Okay, it was that computer center. Oh. I think it's, it's the same one then, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, we had those big computers and mm -hmm. yeah. the so, craze, the old craze. Yeah, they still use uh, tapes for their final stuff. Yeah, it makes sense sometimes mm -hmm. for large archivals. And then the short, the short tapes went into these honeycombs, and there were these robot arms, and you could retrieve right. yeah. uh, with an XYZ coordinate. Yeah, the tape yeah. robots. Yeah. And we have that tape robot in the collection. Uh, that's true, we yeah. do. Yeah. The one from Livermore Lab? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we have a lot from Livermore. Yeah, they've been very good. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so your husband got this job, but you had no job, so you decided to follow. No, I was working at the lab. I, right, but I, then when he went to Australia. That, that's right. So I followed my man to the outback, if that's really And you had no work permit probably, right? Yeah, we both uh, at the time were given uh, green cards. Oh, okay. Or working visas, I guess that's what yeah, they were called. Yeah, the equivalent. Uh, of course, um, I didn't actually know what I was going to do when I left. And I did, I, so I quit a full-time job and I quit school because it was Australia. Had you been before? No. Never been. Had no idea what I was really getting into. And what year was this? Uh, that was in 82, 1982. And did you, um, I mean, so what was his job there? Uh, Don was a digital signal processing guy and uh, he worked on satellite data. And I, to tell you the truth, I don't really know that much about what he did because uh, we didn't talk about work. We had so much else going on that we just didn't really talk about work too much. And was it, it was probably classified some of it anyway, right? I can neither confirm nor deny these type of comments. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you, so you like Jimi Hendrix, um, but on the other hand, you, you had no, for you, it was no issue to work for a defense uh, organization. Um, I don't really think I understood a whole lot about what we were getting ready to do. To me, it was just a big adventure going to Australia. No, no, but I'm saying working for Livermore, like working, working for a nuclear weapons oh. lab was no, you didn't have any inner conflicts over that. I love it that you asked this. The truth is, in that era, is when people started thinking about the Earth, right? We started Earth Day. Well, that was 1970. Then. Right, and, and going into a nuclear weapons lab was not something that I thought, well, I'm going to work on nuclear weapons. What I thought was, no, I'm going to stop nuclear weapons. That's actually what was in, in here. And so um, I wasn't really like a big rebel about it, but when I would be asked if I wanted to work on a project, I would say no if it wasn't in tune with my values. And so where I ended up was actually in a group of people that were in these ratty little trailers on the edge of the lab at the time with a very small budget who were working on anti-nuclear weapon treaty verification 
technology. So the guys that were going to Geneva in the UN, they had um, to have the technology to back up being able to know, like if these people sign a comprehensive test ban treaty, are they actually doing what they say? And so one of the best ways to do that was using seismology. And the um, problem of processing all that data was massive. I mean, we have big data now, but we also had big data back then. It was just not something people knew so much about. I mean, they were collecting in a global network that was 24-7, and you had to look at everything that showed up in the signal in order to know whether it was river ice breaking up in the spring or a truck going by or actually something significant. You couldn't just let one of them go by. You had to look at all of it. So it's a really juicy um, problem for artificial intelligence, which is, but, but this is after I got back from, from Alice Springs, so. Oh, you can. I went okay. back to the lab, actually, when I returned from Alice Springs. And sorry, in, in uh, college, though, what, what degree did you get? I got a bachelor's in computer science with okay. a minor in math. I switched out of oceanography when I just, I just was like, you know, I love rocks and I loved like the lab, the geology labs and stuff, but I was just spending all my time on computers. Just ended up that way. Okay, so then, sorry, let's go back to Australia when you first arrived. Um, so, yeah, we, we flew in from Sydney to Alice and uh, this was just after the honeymoon. And uh, we spent our honeymoon in New Zealand. But the, um, the immediate arrival was um, me trying to figure out what to do in a way because I thought I was supposed to be this good wife. And I'm seeing this on film, I don't know, um, but it's true. So the, the thing I thought I was supposed to do was cook and clean because suddenly I didn't have a job and I, and I wasn't in school anymore. But, um, you know, I would sort of wait at the door for him to come home from work like a faithful golden retriever, having waxed the floor three times, hoping he would notice the shine. I mean, what kind of thing was that? But with, so, a, mar with a martini or? No, no. Well, we did have the, ch you know, the greenies and the blueies. Um, but um, I actually um, set my kitchen on fire uh, we, there was no Mexican food, and we really missed Mexican food. And so there were no chips even. No, you could make your own salsa, but where do you get your chips? So we had, somebody from, from L.A. would send in these shipments of, of Mexican supplies, Mexican food supplies. And so I was trying to make these chips, but the grease in it just so. Anyway, after that, we decided that I should try to find something else. And he didn't really care about that stuff, and I didn't know how to be married. What does that mean? I suppose everybody goes through that, but um, that's when I wandered downtown and, and to the Apple, well, there was a computer store downtown, and I just started hanging out down there. In Alice Springs. In Alice Springs. It was just a little, it was more like, you know, like an old sort of uh, fix-it shop that had also sold some computers. And um, that guy knew the people at the local community college and so he phoned him up and said, hey, you guys should sit down together. So that is kind of how we got started working on uh, computer programming classes in the Outback. And how big was Alice Springs at the time? How many people? Oh, gosh. Um, Alice probably, it, it definitely had less than 20,000 people. Um, the, the area where Alice Springs is is um, a territory. It's not like a regular state. So the laws there are mostly the indigenous people and it's a very sort of sacred area. So in town you would find um, when you went to the grocery store or you know just walking down the street there were a lot of indigenous people and uh, there's probably at least 12 different languages because Alice Springs was the place where all the different tribes would come for their connections with their um, legal proceedings, whatever they had to do or in the hospitals oh, were there. okay. Benefits or lawsuits. Or the things that were supporting their life as they 
continue to try to live with the modern world. It's, it's still an ongoing uh, resolution of how to do it. In fact, the Australians are now in the middle of negotiating, giving back most of the country to the native inhabitants. It's quite and fascinating what's happening there now. But at the time, was it, I mean, what were relations like between the natives and the settlers? Gosh, um, well, I think, I think I would not be able to speak for the entire city. Oh, yeah, no, but I mean, your impression when you it, came in, was it polarized? Was it? It, I wouldn't say it was, there was any tension or anything. I think people liked each other, basically. It was just a, uh, they were in their own world. They, they are in their own world. They don't live in houses. All of nature is their house. And many of the things that go on in their lives are related to that. As far as I know, I'm not an authority, but I know that um, there was um, an article in the paper when uh, the first Aborigine, uh, well, native ha inhabitant um, began to work at a bank because they don't work with paper. Their art, uh, a big part of the culture is art and music. And all the instruments and all the art is made from natural things. The, the paint is made from local rocks and the instruments like, for example, the didgeridoo, it comes from a hollowed out uh, tree limb, which is made by termites. And their corroborees or their gatherings have to do with um, things they make. The music for that is also made from you know, the sticks. And, and you, you described people sleeping in the, um, what, sleeping outside, coming in the dry riverbeds. Um, there were town camps, so the, the region of the Northern Territory has uh, a great deal of land that belongs to the Aborigines or the native inhabitants, and they have um, sacred sites. It's, it's a world called the Dreamtime that um, occasionally, yeah, they camp in their dry riverbeds. Mostly the, the region around Australia is like an ocean of sand. So it, Australia itself is a continent, which is, has no borders with any other country. It's an island. And so um, the interior, though, is mostly desert. And Alice Springs sits right geographically dead center in the middle of three big deserts. And so, yeah, so you have the Northern Territory, which is, um, belongs still to the native inhabitants. So, so then you did become, um, well, you worked at the community college, but how did that come about? There was a woman there named Anna Lichtenberg, who it turned out also went to Purdue. And uh, we sat down and talked, and uh, she found out that I had a background in computers. And the college at that time was just starting to think about creating a program uh, for the community to learn about computers. And so it was just, things just lined up. I happened to have nothing to do. And uh, I was anxious and eager to find something to do there. And Anna was starting to think about creating a program. So we created the first class, which was just a general introduction to computing for uh, whoever showed up. And it filled up almost immediately. So uh, when you went into the, into the program, were there actually computers already there? Oh yeah, that's one of those questions. No, there was nothing. We were in a little group of uh, makeshift buildings at the end of town near Anzac Hill. And uh, yes, the first class and uh, all the other classes except for a couple of them, were done without computers. Uh, which is, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've heard people in India talk about why they do math and people in 
uh, jungles talk about it because the power goes down all the time for them. But for us, there was just, it just hadn't happened yet. So there was the store in town, but that was the only. Right, and there you, was. you didn't have the budget to buy them, obviously. Uh, well, it was just getting started for people to even think about it back then. And uh, because there wasn't that many people in town. And, um, you know, so the first class was a general introduction where we talked about input and output, you know, the keyboard, ASCII, and uh, how can you use computers. But I also got into talking about, like, what's computable. So I taught them about the church Turing thesis, and I taught them what a Turing machine was. And that was actually a homework assignment, was to create a Turing machine. And so we did a lot of things on paper. Um, that was the first quarter. So we had the first class, and then that filled up, and we had a second class, and that filled up. So then the next quarter, uh, because uh, the people in the first class wanted to have more, we added more different classes. And so we kept the original introduction classes, which now there were three of them. And then I added, I, I happened to have thrown, uh, when we were packing, I threw everything that had to do with my computer classes and all the magazines I had on my shelves, I threw them in a box and brought them with me, just in case, because I had no idea, like I said, what I was gonna get into over there. And so I just so happened to have uh, an issue of the communications of the ACM which had an article about how to create a stellar computer science curriculum. And that is actually what I looked at, you know, when these classes filled up and I needed to add more, I started looking at what they recommended for that. And then, of course, I had my, my uh, books and my notes. And uh, so we added a class on uh, algorithms and data structures. So we taught them, we taught people about queues and stacks and uh, files and arrays and um, and then have, there was a class on computer architecture and, uh, you know, De Morgan's Law and or not, you know, Gates. As the next level up is the chips and then the computer architectures, the memory and uh, CPU and clock and, you know, the uh, program for the cycle of executing instruction sets. What's an assembler? What's a compiler? So we also had a programming class. That's when we ran into the problem of needing a computer. Hmm. So it became very clear after like the second week that everybody was just going to be totally bored if we didn't find some way to get them actual computers. So um, my, my husband rallied and got a couple Apple IIs and then we also had a couple other people bring in computers. We only had four computers in the lab so I created this little lab. And of course, there were a lot more people than that, so we had to have sign-up sheets. And I mean, it was really kind of, uh, oh gosh. You know, I look back and I think, how did we do that? I mean, you know, but it just happened, so. Um, and then after that, I, I added, like, so there were continued to be more interests, and so I added the same classes for the third quarter, but I threw in complexity and algorithms, because that was, you know, mathy. So, um, but people weren't that interested in, you know, in login stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they, wanted, they wanted to get their hands wanted, on computers. Yeah. yeah, how do I use this thing to help me with my <coughs> life? You know, I'm on a sheep station out there. Can I do something with it? Or, you know, I want to organize, even something simple, I want to organize my recipes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many students were there in the program? So the first uh, class, I was, that's what I was trying to remember, because this was so long ago. But um, the first class was, I think we had eight sign up, and it ended up about maybe 15 or 20 people. That was, that was as much as the room could hold. And then... And what kind of people? Um, townspeople. We had a few people drive in from the stations. But mostly townspeople and uh, kids who wanted to learn. There were some high school kids who came. So a range of ages. Mothers, all over the place. For the introductory classes. And then for the more advanced classes, it, it, it tended to be um, fewer high school students. They weren't, you know, they're high school kids. They want to have fun, you know. So uh, when it got serious, we did program a game. We used BASIC and we programmed uh, some file in and out, you know, created a small 
database and stuff like that. But it was pretty simple, but it was really about the concepts of computers. And, and I kind of think as we have more and more computers in our life now with the Internet of Things, people really, you know, well, that's what's behind the Raspberry Pi project at Cambridge, mm -hmm. right, to educate the public about computers. So. And uh, so you had a couple of Apple IIs and a couple other pieces. Uh, now, what was the sort of, how long did your, your work there go? So uh, I was there for uh, 15 months. Mm -hmm. I had taken a leave of absence at the school, my grad school, and I didn't want to lose that, so I came back as I had promised I would so that I could keep my position at the school to go back to the PhD program. But your husband stayed there. My husband stayed on for the rest of his tour, which was another five months or so. And then we moved back to Livermore. And uh, I was in, you know, the same place I was. And, and that's when you were working for the verification group? Right. I got a fellowship and for grad school that was, um, and it, that enabled me to take the money with me w with whatever project. So unlike a lot of graduate students who have to kind of like count how to the professor because the professor's paying them and they have to do something they hope will be interesting. I, I was empowered with my own funding and I could go to whatever project I thought I wanted to work on. And that was a very fortunate blessing now that I look at it. And were there many other women in computing at Livermore? Oh, uh, there were some. Um, <laughs> You know, it was mostly physicists there, and the computer people were sort of supporting. And um, I, I do know that the um, group I was in, uh, there were a, a lot more women in the group I was in than the other groups, and most of them were really good looking. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on there, but um, anyway. And so there's sort of the, the stories about uh, sort of the stratification of Livermore among, uh, you know, you have various levels of people there as they interact. Did you ever experience any of that? What do you mean? Sort of like uh, that the, like the physicists are sort of on the top and everyone else is oh, supporting that. and propping them up. <laughs> You're oh. asking me if I experienced phys physicists as arrogant. <laughs> I would say yes. <laughs> Um, but rightly so, because when you start to look at what physics is, they're studying the universe. What is the universe made out of? And, uh, but yeah, the programmers, I don't think they really understood that the computers were essential to what they were doing. And it was I mean, the physicists. important. Yeah, and it was important, <laughs> you know, not to sort of be rude. So yeah, you, you pegged that. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a lot like CERN, where... Uh you know, the, the whole invention of the web was against the backdrop of computer people in an organization where physicists were the, the, the rulers. So it's probably it's a similar invisible. feeling. But you didn't have a distinction between, I mean, all the physicists were essentially building stuff. There were, or the, were there many theoreticians? Yeah, you had both. Um, the, well, the group I was in uh, for, so my PhD work was in the earth science group. And so I was really around guys who st understood digital signal processing and were inventing algorithms for trying to piece out information from really crazy signals coming out of uh, nuclear tests or not. And um, the, the group was definitely a heavy um, male, but there were a few uh, female earth scientists and they were very cool. And we're all still friends to this day, actually. Okay. So. And what was your dissertation on? So my dissertation had to do with cooperative software agents that were analyzing uh, a global network of monitoring stations to support whether or not there had been a violation of a comprehensive test ban treaty. Wow. OK, so, so basically, you got to have the technology to back those treaties up, really. And uh, I did get to go to Geneva. I did get to sit in on these UN subcommittees and 
um, it was fascinating. You know, but I think when you're in the moment of doing this stuff, you don't think about it. You just do the next thing. Chop wood and carry water. <laughs> so how long were you back in California? How long? Because then mean, you went back to Australia or not? Um, I traveled in Australia again several times, uh, but I didn't, I mean, you know, the period of time when I created the department, um, Alice Springs, when I went back, I was there as a tourist. I didn't go back and work again there. Uh, so I, I guess what you're asking me is when I finished graduate school, what did I do? Is that what you're asking? Oh, but or? I thought you had gone back. I guess I was wrong. Uh, because w where does the telegraph station fit in then? So for the longest time in the 1800s, uh, most people couldn't make it across the continent of Australia from the top end. So Darwin is in the top end in the north, and it sits next to uh, Papua New Guinea and, and Indonesia. And they were trying to connect across the land in order to bring goods in and to communicate. So Australia is a colony of, of England. And to communicate back with England took months and months. Things had to be sent by ship, so they were motivated to set up a telegraph. And the original uh, explorers finally broke through and created a telegraph station in like the 1870s or 1880s. And that was in Alice Springs. So the idea of transitioning that area to include the internet has um, a kind of import, which I don't think I realized as an American to that history of the place and um, bringing them into the modern life, modern world with diffusing the ideas of, you know, computer email and oh, surfing the web and all those things, especially in such a remote region. But that came obviously later. I mean, back in when you were there, I mean, that's, there was no, you weren't networked to anything. Oh boy. <laughs> we didn't, I mean, there weren't even very many TV uh, shows. Why? There were two or three stations that showed occasionally. Uh, there were often reruns of either knee surgery or a cricket match. And uh, so there were a lot of video rentals going on. <laughs> So the continuation from when I was actually there and set up this department was that over a period, so I went back to the United States and finished my, my graduate studies. And meanwhile, the college kind of, the computer science department continued to grow. And it eventually became what is now known as Charles Darwin University. So the IT department actually offers um, degrees. I mean, we had a curriculum that could have been a degree, but now it's full-fledged, and it's part of a, a national set of campuses of Charles Darwin University. So just tell the story that you think is, is important about Alice Springs and about bringing that connection to it. So when I look back at Alice Springs, the town itself, um, and what we did there in terms of creating uh, a community connection to the modern world with our computer studies classes. The place itself is smack dab in the middle of a big set of deserts. The continent of Australia is on the edges some jungle and greenery, but mostly it's an ocean of sand. And so, and it's also hot, and there's flies. I mean, flies. And there are poisonous snakes. There's poisonous spiders. We had a redback spider in our mailbox one morning. Um, you better have a four-wheel drive because the roads are not very good. Um, at the time, so, so think about the continent of Australia and then put your finger right in the middle. That's Alice Springs. To the north, the biggest town is on the coast. That's Darwin. That's 1,500 kilometers or 1,000 miles. To the south, 
the biggest town is also on the coast. Same distance, about a thousand miles or 1,500 kilometers. You want to go west. Perth is the biggest town, that's also on the coast. And to get to Perth, there's no straight road. You got to go first down to Adelaide and then go straight over past the Nullarbor Plains. The Nullarbor Plains are the edge of the continent that used to be connected to Antarctica. So when it, Australia broke free from Antarctica, like there was Pangaea and then there was a part of Australia and Antarctica that stayed together. And so the, the animals that are living there are extremely unusual compared to the rest of the world. The climate is extremely unusual. It can fluctuate 50 degrees in one day. And so we had, um, well, so the roads. So, and there was a, a train uh, called the GAN, and they called it the GAN after the Afghanis who had camel trains. So until that train track came in from Adelaide in the south to Alice Springs, everything came in by camel. And so you still ha you had camels around town out in the dumps. There was a camel farm and uh, the gal that did uh, from Alice to Ocean, she trained in Alice Springs to do her trip. Um, and this is really just to paint a picture of the place. Um, there's not much to do there, which could explain another reason why people showed up for the computer classes. Um, but the, um, the best thing I thought was going out in the four-wheel drive. And, uh, but you had to be prepared in case you broke down. There were uh, not very many places to get help. So we had an uh, extra battery and we had, uh, I had to learn how to take a fan belt on and off, practice tools, always have water and an extra jerry can of gasoline. And uh, one time we went out to Uluru, which is a sacred site, um, Ayers Rock, and there was no uh, bitumen road. There was no, it was dirt. And uh, well, we hit a rock and cracked the gas pipe. So we were a bit stranded. We got a ride from uh, some Aborigines. And uh, we were very grateful for the ride. But I tell you what, um, in the back on the floor was a big giant guana that they'd killed for dinner. And so, but you know, you just do it. And so this is, in a way, a place that is out of time. It is as if the Europeans had really never been there. And so I think when you start something like a computer science department, you don't really appreciate perhaps how that can have a shift in the history of time of a place. And, um, and so now that it's like sort of grown up to be Charles Darwin University, the town actually now has stoplights. Um, they didn't even have a stoplight when we were there. And when they installed the first stoplight, um, there was a jingle on the radio, you know, red means stop, green means go. They had to really, you know, soften that message. People were colliding. And they were like, it was on the radio, oh, so-and-so had an accident, you know, you gotta slow down, you gotta stop. You know, put the brakes on, come to a full, you know, it was really quite uh, out of time. There were no movie theaters, no real restaurants to speak of which is why I was interested in cooking Mexican food. Um, and um, so that, I think, is some of the picture. I mean, the animals were remarkable. Even though it's a desolate, godforsaken desert place, it's, it's magical. And there are emus, which are like an ostrich. And that's actually how you can save your life if you're stuck out bush. Uh, emus are very curious, and so if for some reason you break down, what you do is you get a big stick and you tie your t-shirt on there and you hide behind the bush waving the flag, or, you know, the shirt. And when the emu comes close, you grab it. So that's dinner. But that's, that's something you learn when you, when you go there at first. <coughs> and. Um, the birds are incredible. There are cockatoos, which are these like exotic tropical birds, and they are hanging out on the lawns where the lawn sprinklers are in the morning, like pigeons here. Except, I don't know, what do they cost here? Five or ten thousand dollars each? And uh, they're 
zebra finch, which are these little baby things with bright red beaks and like spotted stripy feathers. And galahs, which are like neon green. You could see them by the thousands, just shifting like a school of fish. And brumbies, wild horses. One time I, I slept outside and woke up and there was a whole mob of kangaroos. I woke up to the sound of toot, 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 <laughs> hopping. And then I realized I'd slept in a whole bunch of kangaroo poop. <laughs> so um, this is, I think, a picture that really does um, make a big part of the story of, of why, why that was an important part of history to do that sort of thing. And, and now if you go there, there's a train going north, and the road going north is better. And There was not a train then. Or? No, there was a train from the south into Alice, but that was it. The track going north, there was a one-lane bitumen, one-lane tar road. And the other danger, I think, on the road was not just um, finding gas and getting help if you broke down, but there are these things called road trains, which are these massive, like, three and four lorry or semi-truck um, jobs that could just blow you off the road. But there was regular mail, I assume. Yeah, there was good, regular mail Good telephone service. Pretty much. Um, the, the mail came, one time it came on a horse, but, and, and, and these were like backup systems. There was a guy in a motor scooter who mostly delivered the mail. Um, and we had the um, the opportunity to experience a lot of weather phenomena when we were there, which is another reason it's good to teach math if you're going to teach computers, if you're in an area of the world that has climate problems. So. And the, um, so the telegraph came early, but then after you left, I mean, I presume that they, they got online at some point, uh, what, first? Were there people logging into BBS at all? Probably not. Telephone is too expensive. So I mean, it wasn't until the internet that. Uh, or when was the first? When was the internet brought to Alice Springs? Is that what you're asking? Well, I mean, there probably was not a UUCP phase because there's not enough nerds there. <laughs> they were probably not dialing up BBSs given the telephone charges. So I assume there was no connectivity until well into the 90s, right? I think that's pretty true. I would say that there could be some exceptions to that, but um, because of the technical people who were working outside right. of town at Pine Gap, but the general interest in technology was uh, just getting started. I, I don't think people that lived out there cared about being indoors in an office with a machine. They really learned to do things for survival, fixing cars, uh, cooking, doing hair, reading even, learning to read. We had a reading studies class. And so the computers, when you were there, people were buying for standalone use for what? Standard early 80s things, word processing or spreadsheets? Or yeah, of the few people who were already interested, I mean, they would do things like index their videos. Right, and videos must have been big already by the 80s, right? Starting to be. Yes, um, those were probably the most popular stores in town <laughs> were the video stores. Uh, so let's go back actually to after your time at uh, Livermore. What did you do after you got your degree? Well, I had a, uh, a lucky streak again. I got to go to NASA Ames. That was my dream. I wanted to work at NASA. And I got in the, so my, my thesis was on artificial intelligence and I got absorbed into the artificial intelligence group there. And um, when I was there, I was working on uh, these off-planet robot teams. That was one project I had. It was a big uh, four-story high bay and they brought these uh, simulated lunar environment and simulated Mars environment in and we got to create that environment. It was like, magical, fun, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And uh, so the, I also worked on another project, which was a global network of robotic telescopes. Mm. And that was kind of cool because we were sort of creating a new way of doing astronomy. So we had, uh, before you had these isolated individual sensor, uh, well, they're telescopes, but I guess I can think about the project I did before with distributed sensors as a retrofit. And so you can actually connect one telescope to another past the star. So as the night progresses and the sky changes and the light comes up, this telescope over here takes over. And then that, so you have this 24 hour uh, science going on, mm -hmm. as well as automatic cataloging of what's going on. So that was another project uh, that was really cool. Um, and then after that, I, um, I got involved in, well, I, I did go back to Australia a couple times, mm -hmm. but by an unconventional route, I took a freighter. So I sailed across the Pacific and got to see incredible islands off the coast of New Zealand. And in fact, you know, you can smell New Zealand before you actually get there. And because it was blooming. And uh, a lot of the islands, Rara, Tonga, Tonga, Pago Pago, things like that. There's more stories there, but it doesn't relate to computers. But actually, I did uh, write papers and do research on the boat in my, my cabin. And there was a seven foot wide mahogany desk. And I'm probably giving away a kind of a secret for people who really want to get something done. But on the boat, everything's done for you. They cook your food, they make your bed, you don't do anything except lay in your lawn chair with a bucket of ice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I got uh, a job after that at Stanford University in uh, the School of Medicine. But it was joint with the Palo Alto VA Hospital and that was looking at um, supportive equipment for the quadriplegic veterans. And uh, so it was really um, all in the Bay Area. I, and I, I sort of got to know Berkeley as a grad student, even though I was at Livermore. It was an interdisciplinary program. So my PhD advisor was Latvi Zade. He was in the computer EECS department at Berkeley. And he invited me back um, to the department because there was a mining company in Australia that uh, gave us a big grant for the same software, the distributed sensor. And that was in 96. And I left Berkeley right when 911 happened because Berkeley is like Halloween every day. Uh, it's a very interesting place. But if the world starts going crazy, it's, it's not so clear I, I wanted to be there. Uh, so I rented out my house. And I came back over to Stanford and was me immediately absorbed into John McCarthy's AI group. And I started working on emotion-oriented programming and compassionate intelligence. Instead of looking just at logic, I started looking at what it is people are going through in cognition. So children who have reading disabilities, if they are sitting on the lap of a loving grandmother, their reading problems often go away. So there was a real connection. And this was right at the time when brain science was starting to go crazy. And you had people who were mapping the neurochemistry of the brain on, on every uh, receptor site in the body. So there is a relationship between emotions and cognition and the body and all that. And so I really, I, I couldn't find what I was looking for in computer science. So I went outside and studied Chinese medicine. And I began studying with these Tibetans who looked at the mind completely differently and other cultures that had but mind what, what were you studies. looking for? Pardon? What were you looking for? You said you couldn't find it in computer. I w yeah, I was looking um, for a way to bring emotions into AI. There really wasn't anything. There was one paper. It was a sleeper paper uh, back in the 80s. And uh, it was entitled, Why Robots Need Emotion. I think that was the name of it. And that was Bo Bosniel? Cynthia Bresniel? Mm, oh, no. That, Cynthia, that was much later. Oh, she was later. much later. Um, so I started working on uh, programming software with emotions 
when I was still at Berkeley. And that was right, Roz Picard was just starting to do her hardware at that time. So she was doing the hardware side of emotions and I was doing the software. And a friend of ours, Henry Lieberman, knew both of us and he put us together. And we were both keeping ourselves under the radar. We both had outside work that we were doing that kept up our jobs. Because emotions were not considered to be rational. They were not considered to be part of a rational thought. And so the idea of bringing this in, I mean, I, I showed a white paper on emotion-oriented programming when I first created the language to my department chair. And I'm sure he's gonna chuckle now, but what he said to me was, he patted me on the head and said, that's cute. So people were just not thinking that way. And I think um, it was because I looked at medicine and how cognition is affected by emotion. And because there were these brain studies that sort of supported this avant-garde approach to wanting to do AI, um, I, I, it gave me the courage to go ahead and, and not worry so much about what my colleagues thought and just do it. And so now I come full steam, I'm working on a robot priest, and I've been, mm -hmm, and I've, uh, the paper that I wrote called Engineering Kindness is probably, outside the US anyway, <laughs> You know, it's, it's probably one of the most frequently read papers that, I, that I've got on academia.edu. But, um, so that's more about, you know, what's happened since I left Alice Springs. But the robot priest, does the, any echoes of the robot arm you were playing with as a kid? Um, yeah, I, I do think that robots have a capacity in society to do things that are either helpful to us or that we simply fail at. Or maybe, I shouldn't say fail, but that we, we just, we can't. But I, I, I know that the, you know, the things everybody talks about is, you know, they don't get bored. You, you know, my, my, uh, my doctor says, you know the difference between human and emotional intelligence and a robot emotional intelligence? It's that you can tell your same sad story, your truly sad story, to an emotionally intelligent robot, and he'll cry with you every time. So there, there are certain limits to what we can do, environments that we can't go in. Like I have a friend right now who's got an undersea robot that is from the old, uh, yeah, so I'm friends with a lot of these NASA folks still, and they're still doing crazy things. Uh, Hans Thomas is up in Iceland and Greenland with his robot looking at the ice shelf to look at climate change. They're mapping the seafloor. There's another robot down in the Gulf of Mexico looking at core samples to find out how much of the globby oil from the Gulf of Mexico spill has settled and how it's affecting life on the bottom of the Gulf. Um, but for me, the robot priest had to do with a couple things. It had to do with trust. We have lost public trust in a lot of ways, not just in the church, the Catholic Church. I think most people know about that problem now. Um, but we've lost faith in our banks. We've lost faith in people who are supposed to know what they're doing with our data, who don't. And so I think the, you know, the, the idea of a robot priest, a robot monk, or a robot rabbi follows naturally from creating emotional intelligence, compassionate intelligence in AI, and it does play a role of not only just maybe making us aware of what it is explicitly that we need by trusting each other, because I found biological basis for trust, our immune system, our nervous system, the generation of neural stem cells is affected by our social relationships. Cliff Nass at Stanford in his user experience group, God rest his soul, he's passed away now, um, his, his team, they discovered that you know, we began to treat each other like the objects that we're around. And we're actually changing our brain. Uh, we're changing our genes, even. There's a guy in McGill University who studied how the expression of genes regulating our stress response is affected by how much kindness and tenderness we have in our life. So, if we can bring back examples of that, what that looks like, I think, and populate ourselves with that, it's going to reawaken that idea and hopefully encourage people to
to be more like that. If we do imitate the objects around us and we create these objects and design these objects, these artifacts, with the intention of having positive affect, I, I really hope that's our future. I think something I never knew about uh, McCarthy's group is that he had anyone working on on sort of an emotional artificial intelligence, which is, you know, it, it seems very distant <laughs> from McCarthy's thought. Uh, he's not, really he's not the one. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are asking the best questions. Um, yeah, John. Um, <laughs> well, okay, so I did work on common sense reasoning. Mm -hmm. That's what the software agents right. were using, okay? And uh, that sort of, uh, you know, opened the door. Plus, I, I think there's kind of, once you're a card-carrying member of AI, people are friendly to you and other AI people. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, I debated with him for three years over the fact whether robots should, should have emotion or AI should have emotion. And he actually wrote a science fiction story in response to these conversations called The Robot and the Baby. And he believed that uh, there was a time and place for emotions, really. But the science fiction story demonstrates um, situations where you don't want to have an emotional reaction because people panic. If you give them like uncontrolled emotional <laughs> realm and, and create that, you know, artificially, you're going to have psychoses, you're going to have anxiety, you're going to have depression, post-traumatic stress, you know, all that stuff. Do we really want to recreate that? Probably not. But the, um, yeah, the John McCarthy story is, um, I met him when I was a graduate student. Um, I got an, an award from the uh, AAAI, which is the National AI Group, for uh, the thesis project. And then uh, he signed off on, on that award, and that's how I met him. Um, but we also shared a lot of scotch at the AI <laughs> conferences. Actually, with some Aussies, uh, John was sitting by himself, and these Australians, uh, the Australians can really put it away. Um, they said, hey, look, there's John over there, John McCarthy. Why don't you see if he wants to join us? And so the minute he joined us, he sort of took this tumbler and filled it with scotch. He, you know, he's Irish, so mm -hmm. I guess it doesn't bother him. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, was, that, was Dick Jansen one of those? Uh, those Australian researchers? Uh, Ross Quinlan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Ross, mm -hmm. gorgeous human being. Yeah, I, one of those names that I'm familiar with actually through the world of science fiction, oddly enough. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, that's actually, I knew McCarthy before I got into computer history because he would occasionally attend Bacon. And so we'd go and we'd go there. And then when I saw him there, the last time I saw him right before, it, uh, maybe a year, uh, mm -hmm. he was there with uh, Knuth and everyone else was very excited. To the author he was talking to, I was way more excited about seeing Don Knuth at a convention. Yeah, Don Knuth's a legend too. There's all these legends around here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, John didn't uh, always agree with the idea of emotions and AI, and I had a paper I wrote called um, The Logical Road to AI Leads to a Dead End. He didn't like that. <laughs> Wanted me to change the title. And I never did, but um, I did sort of soften that blow a bit because I think we do need both. We, we need, you know, to really be as, as much potential for intelligence as we can to have hybrid AI. And, and that's really been a theme for most of my work is hybrid systems. So you want AI should have emotions, but they should be repressed then. Well, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I have uh, one system, basically there's a dial and so the designer, when you use this language, you can actually, depends on the application, you can actually dial logic, pure emotion. So hmm. if you want both, you're somewhere in the middle on that dial. And then um, I, I built a truth maintenance system, a consistency maintenance system. And what that does is to incorporate emotion, um, I have personality factors, um, but there's also mood and context, um, but these things affect then, of course, when you allow emotions onto the scene, your beliefs are kind of emotional, you know? Um, your decisions can be kind of emotional, or not, depends on the application. So if it's useful, if it's useful. But when you build those tools, then yeah, you're right. You have to think about, do we want to have emotions here, or do we want logic, or do we need both? 
those are tough technical problems to solve. I'm still working on some of it. <laughs> and, and I mean, and there's obviously technical problems. Are there moral issues involved? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Especially when you think about the fact that we are capturing so much user experience data. The idea that we can capture emotions based on face expressions, that technology's here. What do we do with that? And how should it be protected? Um, I don't know if you know this guy, Paul Ekman. He worked with the Dalai Lama and also studied some of uh, Charles Darwin's original works on uh, emotions in animals and discovered these things called micro expressions. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, right? I know about That's that. probably yeah. his biggest claim to fame. He can tell when people are lying. More, more broadly, though, he can tell if you're feeling disdain. If you're feeling arrogance, if you're feeling haughty, if you're feeling sad, or if you're really feeling happy about something. Say you're in a murder interview and you're actually happy. You probably try to hide that, okay? But micro expressions reveal those things. And if you're trained in how to recognize micro expressions or you build a piece of software that can analyze video data for micro expressions. How do you protect that? Because it's, you know, it's kind of personal. It, 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 there are profound ethics, profound social implications. How do we do that? And there's a lot of people trying to talk about this right now. In fact, um, Vint Cerf is, is having a, a kind of a forum on this in about a month. Hmm. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be there, I'll be on the panel. Um, and, and this is definitely a focus. So um, you guys ask really good questions. But the, um, the actual systems that you've built then that use emotions, I mean, what are typical examples? Well, when I first started out, um, I was really just trying to capture what I'd seen, how emotion plays a role. So I created a kind of um, adapted version of my software agent language. So I added the ability to create objects that were emotional objects. And I added semantic, uh, an ontology that included some of the core concepts in uh, psychological theories. So you weren't restricted to a particular psychological theory of emotion. So it, cause it's a tool. It's intended like a programming language to be programmed. So um, if you wanted to work with an Enneagram, for example, uh, which is a psychological theory in some sense of, of personality and mood. Um, I, I had a short uh, consulting gig with Hallmark. They were trying to figure out how they could index their card stock. They have zillions of cards going back to the 20s or something. And they want to find out how can we best find, like for seasonal displays or uh, occasions, and so to have that mass of data, it's perfect to point something at it that can understand how to index faster. Um, another application, um, so here in the US, this emotional thing was not really um, accepted quickly. But what I found was people in Europe and other countries were very interested in it. So that's who I ended up working with more. The French uh, government had an interest in video at uh, you know, networks of video cameras at airports and public spaces for protection to look at behavior analytics. And so it turns out if you watched uh, children running around in an airport, uh, they're running pretty fast compared to the parents. Uh, people have certain patterns of movement in an airport and people who do bad things in an airport have a distinct pattern. And you can actually notice that and it can be represented in part with emotions. So that's an example of a hybrid system where you'd want to have um, some digital signal processing, some conventional um, AI with ontologies and things related to behavior, as well as perhaps some emotional uh, extractions from the video. But I mean, it's <coughs> maybe they're more related than I understand, but it seems like being able to analyze emotions or interpret them is a quite separate function from an AI that exhibits emotions. Yes. 
when you start to look at what is now a field of effective computing, you see there's people specializing in expression of emotion right. on the face. People but that's who are analysis. recognizing right. emotion of the face. People who are looking at emotion in the voice or expressing emotion in the voice. People who are looking at representing mental state. So extracting factors that you see and hear, histories of the people, creating a model, internal mo cognitive model of someone. It's, it's almost, I, I gave a talk about this uh, at MIT in, in a common sense group run by Henry Lieberman. Um, these are memes in a sense. You can store them in a file. And uh, Martin Roth Rothblatt talked about this and the idea of capturing cognitive state it can include, and it does include, emotion. Right, but I mean that, I don't think John McCarthy was arguing computers shouldn't try to interpret emotions. It's more about giving AI, giving emotions to an AI, right? Building an AI system that's exhibiting emotions. Yes, that's right. I think John was rooted primarily in logic and math, and he saw the world in terms of that language. And so when I would talk with John about AI, it wasn't necessarily about an application. It was about the fundamental idea of whether AI should have emotion. But have meaning exhibit emotions. Um, or well, even be able to parse was, emotions. For us, for me anyway, no, it wasn't so much about that because I think when you do basic AI uh, research, you're not necessarily thinking about how it will be embodied. Will it be a software agent? Will it be a film application? Or will it be in a robot? Does it have a face? Does it have arms? Is it on treads? That's, that's really a different sort of uh, practice of engineering in a way. If you want to talk about AI, like big AI, okay, that we're talking about what does intelligence look like fundamentally. That is the question that John and I would talk about. Is this, this fundamental notion of AI that we create, we humans are creating these artifacts, should they have emotions? And so in the story, the science fiction story that John wrote, The Baby and the Robot, he does build a robot with no emotion that calculates what to do step by step in an emergency and the human panics. So that was his argument for that. I didn't mean to sort of say that's what we really talked about, but the fundamentals. Uh -huh. And that's where you have to go back to brain sciences. You have to go into like people who work with education for people who have troubles with cognition and look at what's helping them. But more importantly, there is a connection between the mind and the heart and the gut, some people would say. In fact, you know, we're just starting to explore these new paradigms and what it, what it means for the future of AI. And it's, t it's tough to get people here in the core AI group to really move out of their comfort zones. It's easier to go on an international forum where people all over the world who think differently connect. And that's kind of how it's happened. And so you're at Stanford now? or I'm actually at Berkeley. Um, oh, John true, passed true. away. Sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. John passed away. And um, he was a really smart guy. He set things up so his machines and websites would all continue to work. <laughs> And um, so he kept us on, uh, me, his, his wife Carol, and his son Timothy, for a couple years. But then we were absorbed into SRA International. And um, I, but I was really, um, I stayed connected with Berkeley because my PhD advisor was there. And he's such a smart guy, Latvi Zade. He, he always gave me good advice. And usually when I ignored his advice, something went wrong. But, <laughs> um, the yeah, so I'm I'm a co-chair of technology and philosophy and philosophy, and, right. and this was a great broad title because of the things I end up doing are all over the place. So anything I'm done. I'm good. Well, thank you. And or is there anything in particular you want to add? Um. Well, I guess we I just cover? look forward to what happens in the future. I mean, I know this is a history museum, but. What's going on right now in the world with AI? It's hard to even keep up with it. 